on in. You coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we've got lined up for you today. We really have. We've got presenter and farmer Matt Baker and his wife, Nicola Hill, here. Uh, they'll be dropping by the house and enjoying a dish of halibut and also a delicious dish of a wild mushroom and chicken risotto. And we're enjoying some more classic French cooking from a good friend of the show, Mr Raymond Blanc is back. He's back. He's created a souffle. That's going to be pretty spectacular. And we're tasting more incredible produce on another helping of my Spanish food adventures. And don't miss this week's Little Masas, where I'll be giving you the essential lesson in cooking shrimp and prawns. But last, by not means least, I'm joined in this house by a chef who's held two Michelin stars at his Cambridge restaurant, Midsummer House, for the last 20 years. It's a great friend of the show, I'm mine, Mr Daniel Clifford. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, you've got, you've got a little bit of competition here today. Yeah, yeah. You two star Michelin and Raymond. Yeah. I think, to be honest with you, as, as the as two stars level go, Raymond is number one with the longest serving, and I think I'm number two, so... The big gap between two, well, you've got a big, big, up to big, yeah. Well, to be honest with you, he's a childhood... You know, I looked up at him... We're with, all the same. Uh, and, and to all be honest with you, once again, I'll get nervous cooking for him. <laughs> 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 no, you do this to me every I time. I love this, because uh, the last God. time we was here, I did it because it was yeah, good. Claire, yeah. Right, but I thought to kick things off today with the dessert that I'm going to make for a two-star Michelin chef, I'm going to make a Knickerbocker Glory. That's a favourite. That's exactly <laughs> what we're going to do. And I'm going to use some Caribbean cakes that have come all the way from Nottingham. So the first thing for Nick of Glory, before we talk about the cakes, because these are spectacular, is think about the rhubarb. Rhubarb, I mean, it's amazing season for rhubarb. Uh, banging season at the moment. You've got absolutely delicious rhubarb. Most of it comes from Yorkshire, Yorkshire or the rhubarb triangle. Wakefield, Halifax, Leeds area, that kind of stuff. With the rhubarb like this, you just want to cut it into sort of pieces. You can do two things with rhubarb. You can either stew it. I actually prefer to roast it. I don't know about you, yep. but I think roasting it, you keep the shape a little bit better as well. And if you are going to do uh, a rhubarb crumble, I always cook the rhubarb from raw in the crumble. I never cook it separately. Yes, and it keeps the it. bite, doesn't it? I think it keeps the bite. You roll it with sugar. That's the key to it. So, a bit of sugar over the top. You do need the, the sugar in there. And then another thing that's banging season as well with the rhubarb, blood orange. These are amazing. Just take the zest, because you don't want to lose any of the flavours from this. So you can utilise the zest and the juice. The juice and the and the segments we're going to put in our nice little bit of knickerbocker lorry. But we take the zest from these. Blood oranges are just spectacular. They really, really are. And another flavour you can add as well is a little bit of ginger. I like to use the little bit of candied ginger that we've got in here, the ginger and syrup, which is perfect. But you can then take the orange juice, because I'm going to use some segments for this, but look at those blood oranges. They're amazing. Little squeeze of that. You don't really need any more liquid than that, because the liquid's going to come out of the rhubarb as well while we slowly, slowly roast it. This wants to roast for a good sort of 15, 20 minutes in the oven. You can just leave it on the side there. I'm going to start to assemble this up, because this is what the rhubarb will look like when it's done. And then we can add things like the little bit of ginger, the ginger and syrup. We can slice this all up and add that to it and start assembling it. So. I was quite fascinated when I knew which chefs were coming on the show. I thought, <laughs> they're going to love this. It's a bit like when you were a kid. Arctic roll was my favourite yeah. dessert. But nowadays, the go-to dessert for chefs is Knickerbocker Glory. Yeah. And we're going to make it using these. So to find out where about this amazing cake's come from, we're going to head to Nottingham to speak to Colin Harrison and Paulette Griffiths from Harrison's and Griffiths Caribbean Cakes. Welcome to the show, guys. G great to have you on the show. Hopefully, I'm going to do your amazing cakes justice. So, so Colin, tell me how how did the business start? Back in 1986, I decided I wanted to work for myself, doing a, a business. But my my so my mother used to bake. Yeah. And she used to bake what they call a black cake, which is a very nice, same text, same flavours, but just it was quite heavy. So once you've had a slice, you think it's nice, but I don't want another slice at right. night. <laughs> And what, oh, were you do what were you doing prior to this? What were you doing for a living prior? Were you, were you a chef? What were you doing before this? Motor mechanic, electrician. Mechanic. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> what were you best at, mechanic, electrician or cakes? All of them. I, was, I think I was good at all of them. But <laughs> I, I think I preferred electrician most. Right. So you, you then decided to set up this business, a huge success. Then you then you set it up again as well. You closed that and set it up again. But let, as well, you, you've incorporated your ideas into these recipes as well, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. The cake to food and drink shows. And then we met and I said, well, why are you not doing it now? So I said, well, let's just try again. <laughs> so we did £25, uh, Matt Rock Bass, 
and it just went crazy. So then we introduced like the ginger, the chili chocolate, um, which is what I, I baked those. And look, ginger wow. is my grandmother's recipe. And it just went from there. And it's just, we just never stopped, never looked back. So I worked at London Cheshire Home, so care home. That's what I was doing at the time. And I said, well, look, I'm just going to hand my notice in. We're going to focus on doing the food and drink show. If it don't work out, I just go back and get a nine to five job. You've got a smile but on his face. It, this is this is serving and um, this is serving your cakes to a double Michelin star chef. And he's that here smiling with his smile. But do you taste this this because when I when I tasted these and I've been to the Caribbean as well, to get yeah. something that's authentic, because some of the times in the Caribbean it can be quite heavy, quite dense. You managed to keep the flavours in there, but keep it slightly lighter. This is the rum one, yeah? yeah. No, this is the rum How one. How have you done that, Colin? What did you this took three years just altering the recipe, keeping the flavours, try and get it much lighter until I just keep trying things and it took me three years to get it to actually to get it to oh that texture. God. So tell this 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 rum, this rum cake, where we get people sending bits and pieces on the show. This rum cake stopped me in the traps. It tracks exactly what it's done with Daniel as well. This this rum cake is amazing. Is that authentically Caribbean or is that something that's been put in later on? It's Caribbean. It's what my mum used to make. So I've used exactly the same thing that my mum used to make. Wow. I just altered the flour and altered bits and bobs to get it lighter. Oh, the the second slice, it. second that, slice. That, that needs an See, alcohol warning. That's right. <laughs> See? Mm. That's what I was saying. That I wanted so much, but you've had a piece, you've got to have a look. That is but absolutely you what, amazing. After you've had two pieces, you don't really want to drive after no. that, because that's that's got rum in it, hasn't oh. it? Yeah. The proper rum. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, so, so tell me about the rest of this thing, because what would what would be the classic sort of Caribbean style cake? Would that be a fruit based cake, or would what would that be? Yeah, they're both fruit based. The rum cake is fruit based, but what we do in the rum the fruit cake, we blend all the fruits. Right. So there's no bits, but we get all the fruity flavours without having any after biting into any bits. That is. Um... That's a different league of cake wrap. <laughs> but then, well, then oh. taste the taste the chocolate. And I've just tasted ones. that one, and it's. Um... But you get this aftermath. Oh, it's that slight burn there. That's that's yeah. um, it's cleansing. But the rum cake, the ginger cake. I've got to see ginger cake is one of my favourite things. Yeah, and it's something that we try to make at work ourselves. And never get it right because it's either not cooked, but yours is perfectly cooked all the way through, which. <laughs> This is a recipe for the ginger yeah. cake. The ginger was really ramped up. Um, but when we first took it to the market, it was just too much for everybody. So we had to reduce it down so it was more palatable for the masses. Yeah. So that's why. But generally, it, the ginger would be strong. really strong. Yeah. The well, original uh, recipe was really strong. I absolutely really strong, love yeah. that. But, yeah, the, the rum cake. The rum, the rum cake, cake stopped me in my trap. Oh. And, and, and you're... Well, half you're, of it gone, look. You're making all this in this... this is this, 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 this little kitchen that you're in now... You're making yeah, all these in there. This is it. Amazing. So a big mixer there. But we... Big mixer there. In the big mixer um, there. That's it. Was. But I just—I <laughs> want you to taste. This is the pineapple one as well. So, are you with the pineapple? You're using fresh pineapple for this. What? How are you getting the pineapple flavour into this cake? We get tin pineapple. We blend right. it, so it becomes blended totally out, almost a liquid. So taste... it's more like you get oh the spices God. coming through. So it's a complement of the, the spices and the pineapple. The pineapple just gives it that underlying um, flavour, but the texture and the moisture, that's what you get mm. from, the, from adding the pineapple to it. Yeah, the moisture the is beautiful. The spices are still coming through, yeah. Mm. I mean, that's the key to it, isn't it, really, with, with all cakes, keeping the moisture in, but particularly trying to mass-produce these, that's the difficulty. And I suppose that's the reason why you put it in the tin, to keep the moisture in as well. That That's going to help it even more. But we want to keep the, the, the quality, so we try... What we're trying to do is keep, we manufacture it for as long as possible because we know what goes into it, keeping the quality there um, and just using quality ingredients. So that's that's the key, basically. I, I, I wish you all the very best of luck. And if yeah. you don't mind me asking, this, this is proof that no matter how old you are, you yeah. can then have a passion and start the business. Colin, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you now and you're still working in... in... 70. 70 and I'm years 60. old. Amazing. 
And Paulette, I'm 60. Paulette, you don't look 25. No, 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 no. Definitely don't. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I wish you... Uh, seriously, guys, I wish you all the very best. Yeah. We get, Thank you. Thank you. We get some amazing suppliers on this show, and we really do. And this is the, this is the enjoyment of doing this, uh, because you're introducing... Not just chefs, but the no, general public at, at large, where you get all this amazing produce from. And, and you guys are based in Nottingham, and you're producing stuff like this that, that it's just the flavour of this is just spectacular. I've just tried the half strength rum. Right. Uh, different to the quarter strength rum. And I'll be honest with you, <laughs> I think I'm going to have to get a taxi. <laughs> <laughs> but if you stay on the line, guys, because hopefully you'll see this, I'm just going to finish this off in the style That's of. It's amazing. This is your, this is your Knickerbocker glory. So I've got in here, I've got some, the roasted rhubarb we've got. I'm going to take some marshmallows because I know that Daniel has specifically asked for that. That and golden balls, yeah. which I'm going to put it on as well. But look, you take that, blowtorch. So you're under pressure serving your cake to a two-star Michelin chef. I'm serving him Knickerbocker glory. But look. It looks okay. bad. <laughs> it is, yeah. But what is it about this? I love this dessert. I've got it on my restaurant menu, and it's one of those things that I don't know. It just makes you smile. It's, it? it's just uh, it's everything that we love, but yeah, in in a naughty way. Yeah, a little bit of a little bit of almonds on the top, and then I'm going to take some of this syrup, this ginger and syrup. Let it drip drip around. That's your ginger and syrup all over the top as well, and then. <coughs> I'm going to put a few of these little buns, because Daniel specifically asked for them. A few little chocolate <laughs> sticks on the top. And there we have it, guys. Yeah. Hopefully I've done it justice, really. It's my rhubarb and blood orange Knickerbocker glory with your amazing rum cake all in one glass. It looks amazing. Delicious. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Amazing. So I wish you could run around and get one. <laughs> my job here is nearly done. Yeah. There we have it. I wish you all the very best of luck. Thank you Lovely for joining us. Thank you. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Uh, take care. I wish you all the very all right. best. Bye-bye. How Thank spectacular you. is that? That's amazing. So there you have it. My simple little rum cake, Knickerbocker glory, with roasted rhubarb, blood orange, and toasted marshmallows. Done. Now, there's a picture. <laughs> look, at, look at the smile on his face. <laughs> look at that. Yeah, it's been could, a few years. You huh? can take the boy oh, and yeah. miss star, but you yeah. can't take the take no, the enjoyment out of his face. <laughs> but this this is a grown-up cake, isn't it? The, the, the rum cake is, wow. It makes a difference. That's a different league. Yeah, you just look don't, at yeah, that. There we have it. There we have it. Right, I'll be treating Matt and Nicola mm. Baker to a wild mushroom risotto shortly. And don't miss this week's The Mask Ass mm. in Shrimp and Prawns. That's coming up later. But join us again after the mm. break where Mr. Daniel Clifford will be trying to solve some of your kitchen dilemmas with a little help from the one and only Roman Blanc. Somebody's happy. Mm. Seen a bit? You won't get a word in with Raymond anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Now, I'll be making a first course of a wild mushroom risotto for Matt and Nicola Baker very shortly, and I'll be teaching you how to cook shrimp and prawns to perfection in this week's Little Masterclass. But before that, I'm outside with Mr Daniel Clifford, and we've been joined by top, top chef. Oh, Lewis. Top, top chef. Mr Raymond Blanc. Good to see you, fella. Good Thank to you, see Evan. you. What are you going to be cooking first? What are you going to be making first? Well, I didn't want to show off all of my skills. Okay, so <laughs> Only <laughs> some of them. <laughs> Only some of them. Yeah. And really, actually, to create a beautiful dish that my mum would cook yeah. for a family of eight. Yeah. And it is a souffle of Comté, which is the most beautiful cheese in the world. I love Comté cheese. OK. And uh, hopefully it's going yeah. to rise. <laughs> <laughs> do you, you never know? Do you, I mean, he's nervous cooking for you. Yeah. Do you, have a, do you have, is there anybody you get nervous for? No. No, I'm not. I've never been nervous. Uh, yes, of course I have. Come on, come on. <laughs> come, come on. Come, 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 well, the worst moment I was the most nervous is when I just won Chef of the Year. I never, I was totally self-taught, and I had to yeah. cook at the Dorchester, yeah. okay, for for forty top chefs, 
yeah. French chef, Spanish chef, Albert Roux, Michel oh, Roux. And, and I was a young chef, totally self-taught. Yeah. And I messed up everything. <laughs> it was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> because... Well, let's, let's yeah, have the okay. souffles, all right. <laughs> just, just to show you, you have to be humble. Yeah. Exactly. Disasters yeah, yeah, sometimes yeah. happen. And you must know yourself yeah. a few disasters. Oh, it Come on, a give me the, uh, a disaster. We, have, we haven't got time for, one. One. Okay. <laughs> for my disasters. Right, these two will be cooking for us a little bit later on. But right now, I thought I'd take a look at some of the dishes that you guys have been cooking at home as well. Uh, it gives the opportunity for these guys to have a look at them as well. First up, a big well done goes to Deborah Griffiths, who made this beef wellington for a brother's 40th birthday. Happy birthday there. That looks pretty spectacular, yeah, doesn't yeah, it? Special, yeah, absolutely, yeah. 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 Classic yeah. beef wellington, yeah. lovely. Nods of approval from our double Michelin star chefs over here. Yeah, uh, next up, we've got a photograph from Richard Long in Portugal, who tried that chicken pie in a masterclass that I made a few weeks ago. That was so popular. I cooked the tall chicken in water, mm -hmm. so I poached it in the water, and then you rip it all apart, and then you make the sauce, the velouté, out of the oh. stock that you've made, so you don't waste anything. It's yeah. one of the most popular yeah, masterclasses I've did. Mm -hmm. um, there you go. Well done there, Richard. Next up, we've got a photograph from Shona Gorgeous. from Edinburgh, yeah. who had a go at that steam sponge pudding mm -hmm. I made on the show Back in February. That looks amazing. Did Steve's... you make it? I didn't. I did. Oh, well, that's the idea. People Stand should bust the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there you go. And finally, top marks this week goes to David yeah. Sang, who made this oh, yuzu yeah. meringue tart. At that home. is quality. That, that is, is class. Good. That is craft, my friend. Look at it well. I'm looking okay? at it because you're steam steam lemon puddings. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit mean, okay? Mine's a bit more rustic cheap. Yeah. That's why it's a risk. Yeah. There you go, David. Top marks there. All right. As well as your photographs, we've had loads of questions about cooking and food. So I thought I'd take a look at them now, now and have a go and answer them, a few of them now with the help of these two gentlemen over here. So shall we start? I'm going to put my glasses on because these the, the first two are, I think are cracking questions as well. So this comes from Law, uh, Lorraine Reed. You talk about uh, on the show about chefs being classically trained. What does classically trained mean, and how long does classically training take? You never stop learning for one, so it keeps going. So classically sorry. trained. Well, I can't even answer this question because I'm totally self-taught. I never had a chef for one minute above me. So, so, but I read a lot, of course, a really yeah. lot of classical books, Escoffier, you know, old Carême and so on. And of course, to be classically trained takes the best part of 10 years yeah. to really learn all the skills, okay, which are necessary to be a great chef. Yeah. And that minimum is and that's 10 all years. the basic stuff. So basic. I had to learn it on, on the job. It was not easy. And what about you, classically training for you? I read his book. Yes. <laughs> no, I'll be honest with you, when the memoir, the first Le Manoir book came out, I remember it, and it was... Uh, I remember exactly where I was when I bought it, yeah. and it was that, the Rue Brothers, and then you start looking back at Fernand Poin and all of these, and you... Yeah. It, it's bechamel, it's, yeah. it's Espanol, it's, it's all of learning to cut things properly. Yeah. It's the very beginning, and that's yeah, to say, it takes 10 years, and then you even start to... But you even, you're, you're still learning now, yeah. I know that you... Oh, constantly, because if you stop being curious, you're dead. Yeah. Everything dies. I think the only problem we have now is, is we're, we've yeah. advanced a bit too much, yeah. and they're not learning the basics as much. So you can now have a chef that comes to work for you that's 20, 25 years old, and they don't know how to make a bechamel, and I think yeah. that's... A real quite sad, yeah. But anyway, right, we've got this one. This is the next question. Uh, Alex Broad, uh, I, I showed on the show recently uh, how to turn a mushroom. Um, and he got Alex thinking, uh, it got me thinking, really, a waste of time, to be honest with you, but it's time-consuming. He says on here, what's the most time-consuming, difficult or fiddly job new chefs have had to do when they start working in the kitchen? Mine, mine. I remember turning vegetables like that, and the chef going, "No, no, no, mash, mash, mash," and picking about five or six out of the three hundred that I got right. That was when I first started, and I think turned mushrooms was another one. What was yours? I think peeling grapes was. Uh... Well, that's his yeah, fault. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just... Because they were on your quail dish. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, if you remember enough. the quail yeah. dish yeah. with the grapes yeah. going around the outside, yeah. yeah, it was an inspiration. It was like right, okay. Yeah, it's his I fault. Lost, I lost a lot of staff because of that. <laughs> Okay, so what, yeah. what about you? What was the most time? Because you, you're obviously not working under, underneath anybody. You, you, you must have had, to, had an idea to perfect something. Because I get the feeling you just... Once you get your head round it, you just want to keep going until you get it right. Absolutely. And 100%. Uh, actually, my hardest um, um, challenge was actually to make terrine. I didn't like terrine, for some hour. So I did about 100 terrine. Right. For about a whole year, I did terrine of bouillabaisse, terrine of... 
beetroot stained with also the sorbet, yeah. added terrine of game, yeah. added, I, I, and then I was very good at right. terrine. So okay, but going. it took a whole year. <laughs> no. That's what it is. That's it. You keep you keep growing at it. You'll you'll hopefully hopefully yeah. be good at it. And I can take you on with Terry. Definitely. Yeah. definitely. Shall we have a challenge? No, we're not having <laughs> a challenge. <laughs> challenge. No, here's here's one for you because I know you love your orchards as well. We're going to talk about that later on the show. Uh, this is uh, Alan from Shropshire. Would like to plant some apple trees at the end of my garden. I'm quite fortunate. I've got some at the bottom of my garden as well. I love them. What are the best varieties to go for? Um, if I want to use uh, apples in different desserts, what would okay. you say? Uh, to me, the Cox orange pippin is the greatest apple in the world, and not a French apple. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, first time I, I tested Cox orange pippin, I was blown away by the aromatics, the juiciness, the layers of flavors, and I'm still blown away by them. So, the, the, do, would you make a tart tan with that, or? Uh, yes, definitely, yeah. yes. Tart yeah. tan, Breban would go very, very well as well. And for tart, for tart, I would use my mum's apple, okay, which is uh, René du Canada. And it's not from, coming from Canada. Yeah. I don't know why it's called from Canada, <laughs> but it's the best apple in my house. We had three trees, one Morello cherry trees, a William tree, and we had that wonderful trees of René de Canada, right. just for tart, tart tatin or for uh, apple tart. And that is the best apple for tart. Do you and, grow them in England? And the best can, can you grow it in the UK? Yeah, yeah, oh, right. very okay. well. I've okay. got an orchard of two and a half thousand trees. Well, I, I know, you. that's the reason why I'm asking yeah, you this yeah. question. <laughs> so, I've been to his apple yeah, orchard. You've yeah, got yeah, a few trees, yeah. two and a half thousand yeah, you've got yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they're all heritage, they all connect with a region, a community. It's when I saw his, all these orchards being lost in the UK, yeah. I decided to do that orchard. And remember that, that, that as well as the importance of the apple trees, it's important to put insects in there, bees and stuff like that. You must encourage wildlife in, otherwise you won't get any pollination. That's Absolutely. So we have 17 hives yeah. on the side, and I'm doing a bee village at the moment, just for fun, for uh, the kids. I saw him building this bee village as well. But if you are going to plant apple trees in your garden, the really thing is keep the insects in there, particularly bees and stuff Absolutely. like that, because they'll pollinate everything else. But it's it's very, very, very important. Uh, right, we may have talked about this in sh show before. What's the difference between forced rhubarb and rhubarb that goes naturally? Do you want me to answer that one? Bit of Yorkshireman? Yeah, or yeah. What's the best absolutely. rhubarb comes from France? No, no, no. <laughs> well, it might. <laughs> it might because my mum grew. Uh, 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 <laughs> my mum grew rhubarb for sixty years yeah. just by the compost. Good. By the yeah. compost, so there was so much yeah. moisture, and really... it lasted still there. Okay, it's now about seventy years. Yeah, I've got some. And to me, twenty years. Forget about Yorkshire rhubarb. It's pretty. It's forced. Okay, yeah. it has but such a low taste. Give me any time outdoor, outdoor rhubarb. rhubarb. Any time. So the difference between forced rhubarb is that it's grown in a dark and shed, so it doesn't produce daylight. The actual plant That's... itself doesn't sit in the ground. It's grown on the top. And the idea is to pick it by candlelight, and you actually hear it grow while you're in there as well. The leaves are sort of yellowy colour, the, the stems are, 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 are much sweeter, um, but the difference is, like, I think Raymond is agrees, the outdoor rhubarb, to me, requires a little bit of energy yeah, to, yeah. to plant it. And you it's get not that as pretty taste. as well, it's yeah. not as pretty. It doesn't have that beautiful reddish yeah. colour, you know, which yeah. is... Uh, Please tell me false yeah. rhubarb's not on your menu, yeah? Uh, right. This is the this is the last <laughs> this is the last question. Bev Miller, another thing about gardening. Um, I grow radishes in the bottom of my garden. I love them. They don't take very long, four to five weeks to get radishes. Uh, she's got them ready to pick. What would you do with radishes from the garden at the moment, Daniel? Uh, I would pick them. I would roast them. Roast them with cumin is beautiful. Yeah. I think uh, pickling them, slicing them yes. raw, raw in a yes. salad is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I, uh, with something like a tartare or a mackerel or something like that. Yeah. They are, just slice them, a little bit of vinegar or a lemon juice over the top, some fresh chives on the top and put them in the salad. Beautiful. Lovely. Beautiful. Me, I devour them by the bowl. Yeah. And for me, the best rubbish, rubbish the French breakfast rubbish, would you yeah. agree? Yeah. <laughs> You see? Yeah, yeah, I agree, you agree with you. I agree with okay. you. Okay. So see, you don't have to. I'm not forcing you to agree. <laughs> I agree with okay? you. But it's true because it's got just that light pepperiness. Okay, and delicious. But it's what's amazing between uh, radishes that grow at home and the radishes that get in the supermarket is the moisture, first of all. You put them in the mouth, they're just like water. To, Texture. And then well. you get this pepper. Texture. But they're fiery. Yeah, I mean, the I personally, if I was fiery. doing it, I would, I would do it at crudite over ice, with, and I would make a mayonnaise just with a little bit of usages. 
Just with a little bit of lemon yeah. oil, use the juice, something like that. Use the juice is amazing with a little bit of mayonnaise, and then you dip those in with asparagus, raw asparagus, carrots, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Perfect. There you go. There we go. It's good. Long live Haddish. Yeah, it's long live Haddish. Right. If there's anything you'd like to know about food and cooking, then do get, to, get in touch. We'll try to answer them on the future shows. How good was that, you see? Brilliant. Uh, right. Do get in touch with your pictures and videos. We'd love to see what you've inspired to cook at home as well. Right. Daniel and Raymond will be cooking for us a little bit later on. I'll be giving you a crash course in shrimp and prawns in this week. Little Mascas. But I'll see you after the break in just a few minutes when we'll we're joined in the house by my guests Matt and Nicola Baker. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, we're giving you a beginner's guide to cooking shrimp and prawns in this week's Little Masters, and Chef Daniel Clifford will be treating us to a recipe for quail a little bit later. But first, I'm here in the kitchen with a star of one of Channel 4's most popular programmes of the last few years. From our farm in the Dales, it's Matt and Nicola Baker! Yay! everybody! Great to have you on the show. Ching Ching as well. Cheers. And first of all, Nicola, congratulations. This is your first foire into... To Yes. TV, went to cookery, TV shows and TV shows in general, It, it? is, yes, thank you for having me. So I'm enjoying uh, being it. It's, 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 it's <laughs> a nice introduction, to be honest with you, with the wine Too and much, the... Too much, I believe. Because it's so, on every show. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we're going to yeah. do a little... I'm going to cook a dish for you while we're going to chat about everything you're doing as well. So I'm going to do a little wild mushroom risotto for you. Nice. Really nice and simple. It's really simple. Got some... These are actually not wild mushrooms. These are, but these ones are really the classic farm wild mushrooms over here with the gnocchi and everything else. Mm. But, uh, and the shiitake. But this is the wild mushroom puree that I've made by sorting the, sorting these mushrooms together with these. These are called trompette de la mort. Sometimes you get these fresh uh, and sometimes you get these dried. These are dried. You just reconstitute them in water and we oh, utilise nice. the water as a stock for the for the risotto as well. I've sorted these off and that's the wild mushroom puree that's in here. Nothing else, just sorted mushrooms in there. You can, If you can't get any of these, field mushrooms, the dark field mushrooms are the ones to use as well. So we're going to start that off Onions and garlic, slightly chopped, so nice and nice and fine. If you're doing this, it's almost got to be thinner and smaller than the rice itself, so you don't see anything. So cut the onion that way, nice and way through, through that way, and then fine, fine, fine. You should have been doing this on Blue Peter yeah, over the years. Yeah, that's very well Did you well do any cooking on Blue Peter? Yeah, loads. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, with somebody down there that was kind of shoving exactly. bits yeah, and pieces up. Here's one we made earlier. Here's one yeah, I made yeah, earlier. Yeah, Unfortunately, I don't have that, really. I that, have that luxury. Yeah, yeah. But there we go. A little bit of shallots and a little, a little bit of shallot and garlic in there, first of all. So where do we start with you? Well, can I start with yourself, and really? Because, because you've, you've now written a book. We want to get onto that in a minute. But physiotherapy, yes. that was your first... Yeah, that's what I did. I love science and, yeah. and that's what I did. I went into physiotherapy, worked in the NHS for years. So, yeah, I loved it. I loved being a physio. What, what, what was it that drew you to it when you were, when you were younger? Was it was something you always wanted to do? Yeah, it was, it's one of those things where I just wanted to help people. I didn't want to be a doctor. I knew I didn't want to be a doctor because I'm not very good with the whole life and death situation. But a physio was something that I... I wanted to be a vet, but I wasn't clever you? enough. Simple as that. <laughs> well, that was my excuse. Well, this is the thing. I mean, Nicola, you were so academic when you were younger. Yeah, weren't you? I, I mean, was... She was, I was yeah. Swat. I, was. Swat, I was. Yeah. I'm happy to tell the swat. <laughs> and weirdly, yeah. I wanted to be a physio yeah, when did, I was yeah. younger because of my gymnastic background. Yeah. Uh, but I, like you, just wasn't clever enough. So yeah. ended up doing what I'm doing today in a roundabout way. But so yeah, for how you. Did, how did you, did you meet through injury doing what you did? Or what, what was that happening? No. Honestly, this no. We well, do you want to? We met. Oh, I was doing a '70s reenactment group. Right, up on stage. This do... wasn't in my brief. <laughs> this was... it's a this, of this is pictures. obviously deleted. He's a clear pro at this. <laughs> Please tell me it was Axel in a field with other like-minded people. Honestly, it was a can of, this is a can of worms, this. Right. Uh, but, yeah, it was... Um, basically, it was called Disco Inferno. Yeah. And I... What I was... attracted to you? <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know, James. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I was called Butch Vendor and yeah. I was, like, I was a bartender. I used to do all this juggling and stuff and then backflips and somersaults and what have you. But, basically, when I, when I went up and said hello to Nicola, I was attracted to her straight away. It was love at first sight for me, of course. Can and, I just um, go back? What were you called? Uh, butch Vendor. I was yeah. vending in a butch way, yeah. basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, moving so on, go on. So then I went up and said what hi to you. you in, what was I saying? <laughs> <laughs> I went up and said hello, and then I would disappear for the rest of the evening and then go and get dressed he up. He was in normal thing. gear when I met him, so, yeah. And then after a couple of weeks, my mate who was up and who was the DJ of the night, and we were all the kind of the, the 70s dancers, he stitched me up, exposed, literally revealed who I was, and... Uh, 
and that was it. Really. But we, that was we were teenagers, weren't yeah, we, we were, when we first yeah, met? Yeah. Nicola, yeah. Yeah. Eighteen was it? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, and um, I was hoping to go to physio school. Didn't get the grades I needed. I ended up in a roundabout fashion going off to drama school. Um, physio is a, a lot of a lot of lot of training. A lot of, yeah, lot of... yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot was of work. Was it five years? At... Well, it's three. It depends where you go, but three. I did three years, so it's right. like condensed into three. So yeah, but it's a lot of lot of work and good grades. So then stuff, you so. met Butch. Yeah, I met Butch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> met Butch. And then he's got rid of his makeup and bits of it, only a little yeah. bit of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then came to the farm. Yeah, and, yeah, and, uh, that's it. and that was it. So. And then that leads on to doing what you're doing because I found this absolutely fascinating as well. We're going to get onto your book in a minute, but I find. Both of you had this idea, this this tenant farming business. We're going to show a little clip in a minute, but tell, tell us yeah, about this, because so, this, is, this is a great idea. Well, yeah, for a long time, I've wanted to shed a light, really, on tenant farming and how it fits into our agricultural process. And all those who are out there producing our food in a way that not a lot of people know about. And basically, tenant farming is, is, is renting land and farming it for people a People think that the majority is owned by big landowners and high wealth, and it's not, it's yeah, not the case. Yeah. Yeah. So you get these big landlords that break up their land and maybe have 15 or so different farmers who work the land for them. And um, in conjunction with the National Trust, um, we created the, this TV show where basically it's the selection process of the National Trust finding their newest farm tenant. And over a period of three weeks, the final seven that they've got on this shortlist are invited uh, to the farm. It's a 340-acre farm on the Wallington Estate in Northumberland, a beautiful old traditional farm. It's beautiful, yeah. And uh, they're hoping to acquire a 10-year tenancy because it's so difficult to acquire land. It's so hard to be a first-time farmer. Well, we're going to show a little clip of it in a minute because I'm just going to recap what we've got on this risotto. This is bringing the risotto back to life again. Oh. We've got the risotto that is cool and cool. We're going to add some chicken stock, parmesan, a little bit of mascarpone, some butter, salt and pepper. While that's happening, I'm adding all this and it starts to warm up. Take a look at this, a little snippet about uh, what it's all about. Before the applicants arrive for the three-week selection process, I'm seeing what's on offer. Look at this place. This is magic. Look at the hair barn. This yard, my word. It feels so welcoming. You know, some family is just going to love this place so much. Surrounding the farmstead is a mixture of grassland, perfect for raising livestock, woods and wetland areas, where the right tenant can encourage nature to thrive. Look at these barns. I want it. Oh, we got some beast as well. The neighbouring farmer, Ian, has brought some livestock over so that the National Trust can get a really good idea of how good our applicants are with animal husbandry and working with livestock. And these sheep here are in lamb. So the plan is that over the course of this selection process, sheep are going to be lambing as well. It, I find it... when I, I get goosebumps watching shows like that, because yeah. from a farming background, I've always said to everybody, and I keep saying to chefs as well, to fully appreciate food, you have to understand how difficult it is to produce. Totally. Mm -hmm. I think as a nation, we're so used to going to the supermarket and grabbing carrots and grabbing meat and just not even totally. thinking about yeah. where totally. it's from. But yeah. to, to, to see that, and would you really want to be a lamb farmer? If you, would you, if you really thought about it, would mm -hmm. you really want to be a dairy farmer? If you, if you had every choice in life, it's probably not one of the choices. These, these generations and generations have oh, sure. been doing it yeah. for years and years and years. Yeah, and we're in this fascinating period at the moment as we kind of reshape our agricultural policy going forward, that how do we, how do we make farming as sustainable as it can be, but also make sure that they're viable businesses and that you can pass them on to the next generation that's coming through and support the rural community that we have, you know? It has to, it has to work yeah. at the end of the day. And what's, what's fascinating with all this, while that's going as well, you're putting... Pen to paper, <laughs> yeah. first time ever, and you're bringing out, bringing out a book. Yeah. Oh, yeah so, where, where did, this is independent to everything else. Where, where, does, where does this idea come from then? Tell me about this. Um, this is your first one. Well, I've been writing for a long time. I used to write a lot when I was a child, and I've just written for years just for my own pleasure. And then a couple of years ago, I thought, oh, I'm going to see if I can, you know, do something with the writing. And that's when I got a, an agent and a publisher. And then Whistledown Farm was something that... It was an idea that we came up with, and it's sort of after our farm, the Dales, we realised how much people 
people loved the whole world of farming and the countryside, but people didn't really know a lot about it. And, you know, writing a book for children just to make them familiar with that whole world was, was something I thought was a really nice thing to do. What's the name of the book, just to recap? So it's Finding Hope, and it's the first book in the Whistledown Farm Adventures. Yeah. <laughs> is that, is that right? Yeah. So if, I can, if I can get you, because I'm going to put Matt to work over here, if I can oh, get great. you to chuck me a lemon from behind you, that's yeah. all I want you to do. What size lemon would you Any want? Any lemon, mate. I just need a little bit of juice. It smells big lemons delicious. around here, haven't you? Big lemons around here. So we're just going to finish off this risotto, just nice and simple. A little bit of lemon juice goes in a mushroom risotto. Just a touch. Like that. Salt and pepper. That risotto's finished. I've got sautéed mushrooms over here. I've got the stock over here, which I'm going to reheat, which is a little sauce to go with it. That's that one. But I'm just going to finish this off slightly, slightly differently. So I've just added in here, so just to recap, I've got some butter, I've got mascarpone cheese, and a touch of stock to reconstitute this. Salt and pepper, that finishes off the risotto. And then what you do is while you're reheating that, the risotto itself should be, if the Frenchman was around, and not in my cellar, this is called Baverse. They do scrambled egg like this in France. It just wants to just fall nicely. Problem with risottos, it shouldn't be too solid like that. I've got a bit of that. I've got a little bit of sauce over here. That's just chicken stock. And then what I've got in here is some mushrooms, which I've sautéed. And these can just go over the top. Just dotted over the top like that. Looks gorgeous, isn't yes, it? That <laughs> looks absolutely that. spectacular. We're not finished yet. That's about four quid. Five quid, six quid, seven quid, eight quid, nine quid. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to finish this off. This is, this is this little bit of... This is reduced chicken stock. So the whole idea of this, you get this amazing umami flavour from this bit. And because I love that flavour of chicken and onion. Wow. That kind of stuff. This is a little bit of chive oil. So you get that flavour of the onion with it as well. Just a tiny little bit of this. Just dotted around the edge. But then the key to this is umami flavour. And you get that from this. This is chicken skin. This is, this, this is you put in sheet, sheets of grease with paper and you just bake it for about sort of 150 degrees, 50 degrees. And it's like, like the, wow. the chicken version of just normal pork chicken, just, you pork don't have to, Do you season it or anything? No, like that? it's not been seasoned because you get this amazing marmy flavour from it. You taste it. Gosh, that's lovely, isn't it? That's just a lovely, healthy snack, even sitting watching the telly, isn't it? Well, I don't know whether it's healthy, but we'll, we'll give it a go. Well, I mean, you know, Farmers can call it healthy, we can call natural. it healthy. Let me call it natural. Exactly. <laughs> Good answer. Right. And then we got some lovely little wood sorrel. This is just amazing. This is like, it's like a little bitter leaf that goes on the top of that. And there we have it, my wild mushroom risotto with chicken, a little bit of wood sorrel, and then just finally, over the top, a tiny bit of Parmesan cheese. And there we have it. Oh, Easy as that. Done. That's amazing. That is amazing. <laughs>
the Daily Fish Auction. And I've got my eye on one prize in particular. Denya's famous for this particular red shrimp. It's known as the jewel in the crown of Mediterranean seafood. And I'm about to be a fisherman now that's been out since 5 a.m. to catch some. The famously difficult to catch red denier shrimp can only be caught in this region. And with their intense flavor and blood red coloring, they look great on the plate and are a favorite amongst Denya's clientele. And they're actually quite pricey because of that. There are very, very few of them. So when they're in season, which they are now, chefs and cooks rave about them. I'm looking forward to this. The auction gets underway as soon as the fishing boats arrive back in the dock. What's great about this is you don't actually know what he's got on board. I'm hoping he's got these amazing shrimp. Fingers crossed. The fisherman I'm meeting is called Maori, and it turns out we're in luck. He's got red denier shrimp and prawns. Wow, 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 wow. We have plenty. These are the special prawns unique to this area. Now, I've seen these on my travels in markets as far wide as Madrid and down to Cadiz, I've seen these, but they all originate from this area. How deep do these go? Uh, How deep do you have to right catch Right now, we are fishing in 600 meters. 600 meters? Wow, and it's very, very difficult to catch these. Yeah. Why? why? Because usually gets in the middle of the of the holes. You're right, okay. So you got to go down the hole and go up. Okay. And how far out do you have to go to sea? Right now, like yeah. 21 miles. Wow. Out and 20 miles back. And back. once you drop the net, how long do you have to wait to pull the net? Like five hours. We only have time for one. So one run? Yeah. Well, so you're hoping that they're there. Yeah. <laughs> now they're back, the prawns are categorized by their weight in grams, which will determine their price when auctioned later. We have to know which is number one, yeah. which number two. They're the bigger ones. Number three, number four. 40 and above, yeah. number one. 30 and above, number two. The prize ones are ones, and then they go down to fours. Ones fetch the biggest money. What's really interesting with this is you've got restaurants all waiting for this catch to come in. And within 45 minutes, it's gone. Once sorted, the prawns are rushed off the boat into the warehouse to be checked before the auction. Denia's restaurateurs are already waiting, hoping to secure the best catch for their special boards. In the warehouse, the wait is quickly double-checked to ensure there's been no funny business. But the effort involved to get them means Maori is not taking his eyes off the prize. He's watching every single bit. Every bit. These are like the caviar around here. The creme de la creme. I'm off. It's just a couple of hours before the evening dinner service, and a lot rides on securing the best produce possible. I love auctions. It's organized chaos. You're wondering, Who's bidding? What's happening? Apparently, everybody above and around here is bidding. Everybody. Obviously, don't put your hand up, otherwise you've bought a case of prawns. What's really interesting with this as an auction is that it starts off with a high price and works your way down, and it's a bottle whether you want it. You bid first, you bid quick. But you pay high. It's a risk. The prawns are sold by the kilo according to their assigned number. The lower the number, the bigger the prawns and the price. So this is yours? Yes. 171 euros. For number twos or number one? Number one. Number one, 171 euros. The prize number ones fetch a decent price. Now for the number twos. This is the second. This is the second. Second one. They start at 145 and go down down the road. Start, starts at 145. Watching the clock go down now. These are for number twos. 80, 80, 70, 75. Is that not Very good? Cheap. That's too cheap. Yeah. I would have bought them. <laughs> <laughs> Can I buy a lot? <laughs> Next time. You win some, you lose some. But for Maori, it's all in a day's work. 
but as a chef, it's been a real privilege to experience it. Well, on behalf of us chefs around the world, I want to say thank you, because it's, it's magic to see this. Yeah. And of course, I couldn't leave without buying a few for my next cook. Look at that, 10 shrimps. You wanna, you wanna cook it today, right? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm cooking it today. Thank you, thank you very much. You're welcome. And what time do you go tomorrow? Five o'clock. Five o'clock tomorrow. Well, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. What a special place that was. And those shrimp, those denya shrimp, are some of the finest in the world. They really are. And I'll be giving you a masterclass in cooking shrimp and prawns very shortly. And there's still loads more to come from my guests, Matt and Nicola Baker. That's coming up later. But I'll see you back here in a couple of minutes when the genius chef, Raymond Blanc, will be firing up the hobs, making souffle. I'm looking forward to this. See you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, coming up, I'll be teaching you how to cook shrimp in this week's Little Masterclass. And I'll be chatting some more to my guests, Matt and Nicola Baker. But first, I'm here with Mr Daniel Clifford, and we're about to enjoy a dish from a genius chef who's celebrating a landmark year in his incredible career. It's the one and only Raymond Blanc. That's the very chef generous. Chefy, chefy, chefy. I feel like there friend. should be petals thrown Thank on you, the floor oh, as well. That's oh, amazing. <laughs> to talk about Daniel, I think he's done an amazing dish. I'm doing mum's cuisine. I love it. Home cuisine. OK, and my mum would come out once a week with this huge souffle, and she had a bigger bowl than that because we were seven around the table. OK. OK, and all the ingredients, of course, are from my region. Yeah. Okay, because Franche Comté is known this for is the forest Comté. Beautiful. And, and the gastronomy, my gastronomy, yeah. says the largest forest in Europe, yeah. OK, which provides the wood to smoke. Uh, so then you have the cows, the Montbelliardes cows, with a huge udders creating the best milk. And you have also... It is, when you go see the area, or you see the cattle and you see them in the, the hills, and everything, yeah. it is just spectacular. Yeah. It's a beautiful part. So of it. cheese, of course, is a very important part into our region. Yeah. So then there's a whey. What do you do with the whey? You feed the pig. Yeah. And the pig, of course, what do you do with the pig? You cook the pig. <laughs> and you roast them with the wood from the forest around. Yeah. So it's a perfect style of gastronomy. Plus so you're, you're going to go, not the modern gastronomy, you're going to... So you're going to... Mum's souffle. Mums, absolutely, and they were really delicious. So what goes... I'm going to warm this up for you already. So, yeah, so what goes into Mum's kind of souffle? You. So very simple batter to do a roux. We're going to do that base. Yeah. So do you want me to start whipping up the egg whites? Not yet. OK. Not yet. Voilà. Oh, yeah. So the, so the key yeah. to this is melt it with no colour, first no, of all. You don't want it no colour because that would be... Uh, it would you do burn with it, and that's yeah. not what you want, because okay. you would just want to melt it. Yeah. Okay, so then we're going to put the cold milk into it, all of it. When you finish your roux, I know many chefs so mess up. So you put the, put the flour, in, bit flour bit in next or not? Yeah, of course. You oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. God. yeah. God's sake. <laughs> but I thought you were going to put the milk in. <laughs> so, yeah. Not quite yet. Okay. So you just allow this just to bubble nicely. And... Just melt it a little bit. Okay. Okay, we've got our flour here. Yeah. Let's start to the... Tell me if no, you want it turning down or not. Yeah. What temper? Okay. Up or down? That's okay. No, leave it. Okay. Voilà. And now, okay, we put our flour. So you are fa a house of seven? Yeah. Were, uh, were any, of, any of your family so chefs? So just it. Were any of your family chefs? None of them. None of them. So I'm the only one. Uh, I was lucky to have an extraordinary background. Uh, my father built his own house with his own hand. A huge garden, at least half of the manoir, and that garden would feed the family. That's where you got your love of love of growing things, is it? Absolutely, right. love of growing food, respect of the food, welcome from varietals, and yeah. food is an act of love. That's what we're doing. I'm doing it for you. So, so, so tell, okay. tell me, tell me, all of it, all of it, all of it straight away, all of it. All Just right. pour it in, chef. Why, why cold? You could put warm it up, but uh, you find actually you've got a better dispersion of the flour. The flour swells and the starch swells slowly. Yeah. Okay, and you have a shinier, better, thicker bechamel. Can you put a bit lower? Lower? A lower. bit, one. Happy with that? So, do you yeah, cook out the flour a little bit? Is that the key? A little bit, yes. Okay. You can also golden it, but we don't have time. Right. By browning it, 
you have a nutty flavor which adds to another layer of flavor. Okay. Okay? And it's more digestible as well. See? Voilà, you can now. I can now start. So, egg whites, do you yeah. use a little bit of lemon juice, just a touch? A little bit, yes. It helps to, to coagulate the protein to prevent them graining. Voilà. And that's enough. Always by yeah. hand, the egg white chef. No, I want to show James the development. Strong. You can see. But it's amazing when you see this viscous, yeah. this viscous mass of egg white. And then suddenly, by beating it, what you are doing here, you add billions of bubbles of air inside, creating this wonderful foam. Come on, I want you to sweat. Uh, it's, it's coming, it's coming. Come on, you can do the same hand. Oh, Come on, you can. Okay, so at that stage, we've got a lovely, creamy, silky. You can, and then now you add your turn mustard. That down? The mustard. Turn it down, chef. Or? Yes, please. Turn it down. There you go. Yeah, you can turn it off, actually. It's turned off. It's turned off. So, be now two big spoons of mustard. So we're and here. will give the sharpness, oh. the length, the flavor. So, chef, okay. we're, we're celebrating 40 years. 40 years. Tell me about Le Manoir. How did you end up? So then the egg yolk for richness. Okay. How did you end up at Le Manoir? Uh, well, I ended up at the manoir through, so eventually I was a waiter in my restaurant in uh, Besançon, and then I tasked, started to tell the chef that his sauces were a bit too thick, a bit too heavy. Not much. Big. Okay, thick. okay oh. not like that. Big. We bring as much air as possible so the bubbles are as big as possible, and that makes some difference. Okay, chef. Okay. <laughs> yes, I tell you, he must hate me. Voilà, très bien. So that's your base. Okay, let's turn that off. Perfect. Good. Okay, très bien. So then you have. Okay, très. Oh, you can use that or that. We'll see. So back to the manoir. How did you end up buying that place? Well, I fell in love with it. Just was it. I... I'm totally self-taught. I was in this little restaurant I bought on the wrong side of the road, OK? Yeah. The wrong side of the city. If you can stir that up, that's very kind of you. Yeah. Très, très bien. And uh, basically, uh, I had a, the restaurant had red and white table cloth, cheap prints of Paris on the wall, and I cut a cockerel, and I painted the faces bleu, blanc, rouge, so you knew it was a French restaurant. Right. Incidentally, that's when I opened my restaurant, when England was in a terrible shape. There were strikes everywhere, three days a week. I don't know if you remember, you were young enough. <laughs> you were just being born, actually. Okay. With that? Yes, it's okay. That's good. Okay. So, so we've got... So, yeah. so, so effectively... So, so when, I, when, I, when I bought this restaurant, it was really uh, my first... I never cooked before. So that was really a, a big challenge. Yeah. You know, and that was the worst time. That's what I thought as well. Oh, that's now, it's time to do a French restaurant. Yeah. That's what England needs. When yeah. England was on strikes, and was, and was, <laughs> let's do a French restaurant. That's a great idea. Well, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, clearly worked. Absolutely. And uh, yes, it did work. We were only four, four in the kitchen. Connie, Sarah, Two marks, Mark right. Peregrine works in Birmingham, and my Mark, which is still at the Raymond Blanc Cookery yeah. School after 48 years. 48 years. Isn't yeah. it lovely? It's amazing, isn't it? You know, uh, okay, amazing. so now we just don't leave it to stand too much, too fast. Yeah. Otherwise, you have a. Okay, so just put one third, just one third. Yeah. And then you just. You're not saying anything, you're just voilà. looking. Just watching. Just yeah, watching. absolutely. <laughs> Come on, Daniel, don't you have any questions for me? <laughs> Chef, but the small little restaurant where you painted the cockerel, you got two stars there, no? Yes, that's why we got two stars. That's two you got stars, two stars in the little restaurant? Yeah, and it's Albert who actually, who, who phoned me on full service. So, full service, and I don't take the phone on full service. So five times it was ringing, five times I put back the phone <laughs> until Albert... Voilà, très bien, that's the base. Yeah. That's to lighten the base. And now, voilà. Huh? So then did he tell you you'd got... Yes, so, 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 so effectively, so after five, six times, I decided to take the phone and say, who's there? Who? Right. 
Raymond, t'as le vrai. Ama Albert, Albert Roux. OK Elle s'est dit, dis-moi, je suis full service. Can you... I'm in full service. OK Leave me alone. Elle s'est dit, Raymond, I've got some good news to tell you. You can sleep. What is it So you can sleep with two star Michelin under your pillow. So imagine, for your, that wow. was after three years. No one star? Straight one in. star, no one star. And then two. So now, pull it in, in the middle. Put it in, in the middle. Excuse your little job. Right. Not on the side, make sure you don't touch the side. Yeah. Right side, where is the chef? Where is the chef? Like that. All in the middle. You're regretting taking the responsibility <laughs> now. I'm not, I'm going to get the blame yeah. for this. And you shall waste not, OK, as well. So just clean up all okay. the sides. Yes, chef, no problem. Okay. All right, that's that. Perfect. Très bien. So we're going to add a little bit of um, cheese for the top. Yeah. More comte over the top. So the breadcrumbs will add a lovely crust as well. You see how easy it is. You know, we think of souffle as being difficult. I'll take maybe a bit more of that one. Yeah. And this... But actually, they're so easy. And this so goes this in the oven for how long? For 20, 25 minutes, we'll see, according to your quality of your oven. <laughs> yeah. no. Happy with that? Voilà. Middle Allez. shelf. You go. Straight in. Très, très bien. And then you want to serve some wine with this? Oh, yes, of course. All right. Okay. And of course, I want to show my Jura wine. It's my region, it's my home. And this one is really special. It's, I brought two. So that's done by Monsieur Rollet yeah. as vin jaune. This wine is, when it's been fermented, okay, it's put into a barrel for seven years leaving a little bit of space to, for oxidization. Oh, yeah. it's, it's one of the great one to eat with cheese. So that with we're going to... It's the first yeah. Marie now. So that's one of the... So that we're going to try... Great, great one for my what, own. What about... And done by the biodynamic as well. Yeah. Most of the Jura wines are organic or biodynamic. Well, can we taste that that's one as well? And what's this one that you've got here? Oh, it's a very young one that made the same method, but much younger. OK. OK. And is the colour different? I'm presuming the colour yes, is different. Yes, it will be. It's... Everything will be different. The so colour... You can, you can taste so this taste. one, the difference is... What is this one? What is this one, then? Oh, very different. This, this one is the same... The same, um, the same process. Yeah. But only maybe six months ox oxidation. So, OK. So it's completely different. So I'm assuming you taste this one first, then, do you? Yeah. Well, that's got a few minutes to go, so while we're just drinking this and enjoying ourselves, just, just have a wander down the garden. See you in a bit. Right, the souffle is nearly ready. So just tell everybody what show you're doing at the moment. This, this about, about all the amazing palaces around the UK. Oh, it was an extraordinary, ex extraordinary story, adventure. I discovered five royal houses, palaces, and the extraordinary gardens. And these amazing gardeners with their science and knowledge, creating some, for example, growing peach of York. Okay. In the, the right tip of Scotland. Yeah. It was extraordinary. I enjoy so much. I learned so much. It's everything you love, isn't it, yeah, really? So, the I, history as well as the gardening. And the... Absolutely. So I know you want to and, take the um, souffle out. And I discovered as well the Princess Foundation, OK? Yeah. Uh, that enormous, extraordinary charity, especially at Dumfries House, where there was 17 different craft, you know, whether it is hotelry, whether it is textile, whether it was learning how to, how, how to work with wood, working with communities. It was a great learning process. And I discovered, of course, Scotland, Ireland, all the south of England. So it's been a... a just look at, just oh look, at God, look at this. Look at this. <laughs> look at yeah. this. Yeah. Can I just say, yeah. only you could do that. It's my mum. We yeah. haven't got wow. Brian Turner out the back here. There's yeah. not a false back to the oven. Look at this. Uh, that's what it's about. And we would have that once a week, you know. Once a week. Do you want me to take it out or you can? Oh, look at that. Voila. And a good souffle should hold for at least five minutes. And you've seen how simple it is to make, you know. Yeah. So voila, très bien. <laughs> Sauce voilà. with it? Vive Maman Blanc. On the side? Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the top. Well, no, not on the top, because you want to see 
Oh, look at that gorgeous texture. Oh, look at that. And do you put a little bit more cheese with it or not? No. No, that's enough cheese. That's enough. <laughs> You're so greedy. You're so greedy. <laughs> Cannot be Peter. So, that's so, so Raymond, Raymond, we'll sure. just put that there so we can have a nice little picture of it. So, give okay. us the name of this dish. You're going to name it after okay. your mum? So, it's uh, Maman Blanc, Comte Cheese Souffle. And she would prepare it once a week because it was inexpensive. The cheese was inexpensive, the eggs are inexpensive, and that served about seven or eight portions. And we have seven at home. It's amazing. A legendary so souffle yeah. cooked yeah. by the legend himself. Oh. Raymond Block, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>
that's brilliant to cook with, nut brown butter with fish and that kind of stuff that I'm going to do later on in the show. You can put some of those in it if you wanted to. But these with a potty shrimp are amazing. So we start off with some butter and you want a decent amount of butter. It's up to you whether you salt it or unsalted. It's entirely up to you. But the quality of the butter is key. So get the best quality butter you can afford because that's where predominant flavour is going to come from as well. So a little bit of that in there. Then we're going to take some lemon juice. Nice squeeze of that. And then we add, over here, a selection of two ingredients, one of which is essential. The other one is purely optional, but this is essential. This is mace. It's like a spice. And you get it ground. Sometimes you can get it whole, which you've got to ground up. It's a bit of a faff, to be honest with you. If you're buying it, buy it ground already done. But that's a little bit of mace. That is the essential sort of spice in potted shrimps. The other two are purely optional. I like the little bit of spice in here, so I'm going to use a little bit of Henderson's relish. That's going to go in there. And then I'm going to also use a touch of this, the gentleman's relish. My granddad used to live on this, on toast and stuff like that. This is like an anchovy paste, but it's beautiful, beautiful when it's with butter, and particularly with potted shrimps. You've got this amazing umami sort of flavour from it. It is delicious. So we're going to pop a little bit of that in there, but particularly with the shrimps, it works really well together. So what we're going to do now is just get this machine going and get this whipping up, because what we want to do is whip this up and soften the butter. While that's happening, I'm going to show you my other dish that we're going to make as well. This is a nice little bit of prawn toast, and I'm going to use the peel prawns for this. This is where you can utilise any of the sort of size prawns that you've got as well, if you want. Now, if you want to devein it, and you'll see what chefs call deveining the, the prawns, which is to remove the little shoot at the back. What you want to do is take the knife and just remove that out like that. Just get a knife and remove it there. So this is the back of the prawn, so you can imagine it, it's that way. Once it's peeled, the line runs all across here, really. And that's the same on all sort of shrimp and longestines, it's similar like that. So when you get to this, you just cut through, open it out and just remove it out. You can see that. There you go, get rid of that one. And I've removed quite a lot of these already, so most of this has been done. But just remove that little shoot out like this. Now, you can use these sort of tiger prawns, or you can use the smaller prawns. It's entirely up to you. But these want to go in a blender, first of all. So this is your classic sort of prawn toast, if you will. So a little bit of that. And then what we're going to do is blend this first off. Give it a quick blend. Now, you don't want it blended too much. I'm going to leave that to one side and go back over to here. I'm going to clear this down because I want to just finish off our little potted shrimps over here. So you see now this whipped butter is nice and light, which is exactly what I want. There we go. So it's important, I think, with this, because we're not going to put clarified butter on the top, which is your usual classic potted shrimp where you'd warm this butter up, we're going to call this sort of soft serve. I love this. But you take, you can see our butter now is soft, but you can see the colour of it is changed. That's that smell of that mace and that nice little bit of spice in there as well. But this is, you have this soft butter. Then you can take these shrimp, which we've got in here, and pop these in. Mix that together. Now, the amazing thing with these shrimps, you can buy these shrimp in the supermarket. You'll just walk past it, a lot of people, because they're with the... Smoked salmon section, that's roughly where they are in the supermarkets. And you just mix that together, and then you've got this potted shrimp. And all you want to do, like I said, with soft serve, it's so, so simple. You just take a good dollop like that, and it's that. You don't need to do anything fancy with it. Just serve it like that, as it is. Tastes amazing. That, that spice in there is amazing. And you want just a touch of watercress, like that, with it. And then a little bit of lemon on the side. Touch like that. And then you're just going to have some normal toast. Just serve it with it. Nice two top shots, take the crust off, I would think. But there, you just got a nice little bit of soft serve potty shrimp. Really, really simple. Keep my eye on this one, because it's not far off. That's all right. Right, just to finish off our little prawn toast, 
You need a binding agent for this, and that's just a touch of egg white. So take an egg white, one egg white would be enough. A little bit of soy sauce, touch of that. This is purely optional, the soy, it's entirely up to you. I just think it has a nice little flavour with it. I'm just going to blend that up. And then we have this paste. This paste you then use to spread on two slices of bread, which you've got on over here. Now, interesting facts about shrimp as well, and prawns, particularly prawns, it's all prawns. Like I said, there's, there's thousands of these different types of species all around the world, but they're actually, when they're first born, they're all grown males. And then later on in life, some turn into females. But you take these amazing shrimp, but the colour and the flavour is massively different from different parts of the ocean, how deep they are, cost-wise as well. We've got the larger ones over here. If you're looking at the classic sort of Spanish style, the red ones, the deep red ones, these can be up to sort of 20 pounds each, as much as lobsters that we've got over here. In fact, more than lobster as well. And the same thing with the longestine. This is, I think, they're really the, one of my favourite sort of shrimp as well uh, around the world. These come from Scotland, but these are absolutely beautiful. These are quite small ones. The larger ones can be up to sort of five, six pound a piece for the massive ones. And they're usually from sort of Northern Ireland, that area as well, Strangford Lock all the way up to sort of Scotland. Beautiful, beautiful area to get longestines from. But just quickly, to show you how you cook this. This, you don't cook in olive oil, we're just cooking vegetable oil. So a lot of the time you'll find these are deep fat fried. Just leave them as they are like that. Now to get the sort of the, the sesame onto it, you just take your sesame seeds, and this is the glue that's sort of stuck to the bread. You then take this, turn it over, Press it in there, lift it off, and straight into the pan. But when you're cooking these, you've got to be quite careful that you don't have the pan too hot. Otherwise, you're going to burn the sesame seeds and you're not going to cook the prawns. So what you want to do is cook these sort of a medium heat, just gentle. It'll take about two minutes maybe to cook. Then we'll turn them over just for a minute and just finish off cooking the other side. If you cook them too quickly, the prawns or the filling doesn't cook. You can deep fry these, but it tastes much, much better if you do it this way. So while we're waiting for those, we've just got the little bit of shrimp that are ready. Look, take these out, and there are your simple prawn pill pill. We then take a little bit of parsley, just a touch, and finish this off. It's one of my favorite, favorite subjects is prawns, because they vary so, so much in terms of flavour, texture, like I said, one of my favourites. Never tried before with a denier shrimp. I mean, just incredible, incredible taste. But like I say, keep your eye on this. See, you don't want to burn the sesame, so... Sesame seeds will burn quite quick, so... This is not far off now. But there's your little prawn pill pill. Put one there. And one there. And interestingly, I want to show you this lobster because I grabbed one of these from my fishmongers because most people think lobsters are red when they see them. They're actually blue when you see them like that. And then they go red once they're cooked. Now, you can serve this with a touch of chilli jam or, or it's entirely up to you or on its own. But they're not far off now. So you just turn them over. So we just flip them over and cook the other side. It's entirely up to you whether you use the soy sauce or whether you just use a little bit of lime or lemon or nothing at all. But those prawns with a little bit of egg white, that's all you need just to blend it. And then these can come off like that. But just make sure the bread is nicely toasted underneath as well. Lift that off. And then we can just chop it up and serve it. And these, when you pan fry them, just, they taste amazing. They're just so, so different than deep fried. The texture of them's amazing. Like that. So there we have it. Three dishes, all using prawn and shrimp. 
three of my favourite dishes using prawn and shrimp, actually. You've got the classic Spanish pil pil. You've got the, the prawn toast, that beautiful, beautiful flavour with a little bit of soy. And then you've got one of my favourites, the soft serve potted shrimp with toast, a little bit of lemon and watercress. Done. Easy yeah. as that. <laughs> now, does anyone like to learn about a little mask gas? Then do get in touch. we we'll see if we can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break. We're joining in a couple of minutes where the very talented Daniel Clifford will be firing up these very hobs. I'll see you in a bit. Where do we start? I'll start with that one. Welcome back. Now, I'll be serving halibut for my guests, Matt and Nicola Baker. That's coming up next. But first, I'm here with the brilliant Mr. Raymond Blanc. And we're about to enjoy a taste from the, a legend, a, a UK legend, uh, who can match him on the Michelin star for not for the amount of time. It's close. But catch for the amount of Michelin stars. Up, up. Exactly. Well, it's the brilliant Danny Clifford. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who can gain two star Michelin for 19 years, yes. Yes, uh, exactly. Well, you're about to taste uh, a bit of his food as well. So, what are you going to be making then? So, we're doing a papillon of uh, English quail. English quail? Yes, English quail nice. with uh, uh, some duck liver yeah. and truffles. So, basically, Wonderful. what we're going to start is I've, I've blanched the savoy cabbage leaf. Yeah. I've cut that, so I've taken all the roughness off the outside and I've taken the main stem out of the middle. We're going to season that up slightly, a little bit of pepper. Now, you want this truffle nice and thin. That's what Nice you want. and thin. Yeah. And then basically, I've got, I've got a chicken mousse here, which I've put a uh, duck cell of mushroom, which is like a, a. So you use the chicken breast for that? Chicken breast for that, yeah. Yeah. So that's a uh, mushroom, mushroom duck cell that's been cooked down in a pan, so it's really, really dry. Yeah. Then we take the quail breast. You must use a lot of quail, do you? Yes. Um, and I'm quite. Uh, Happy, so happy to see that these quails actually are not coming from Spain or Italy yeah. or even France, but actually it's beautiful, from isn't it? Norfolk because yeah. they look a lovely colour. They look they've flown a little bit. Yeah, lovely. You know, because um, often you get them it, yeah. a little bit lighter, too light. Yeah, yeah. absolutely too light, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So then, it's a colour. So we're basically, we're making a milfoil here. Yeah. So yeah. this is where you got the truffle really nice, really and thin. nice and thin. So. Is now, it, why is it every time you come on the show, we all, we've all got a bit of a legend that you're cooking for us? Well, well. yeah, it's, it seems to, you seem to always put a challenge up in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, is <laughs> Raymond Blanc is like, yeah. he's like every chef's hero in this country, and he's like the one that's, you know, self-taught. And you get his books. British chefs yeah. are so generous. <laughs> no, they're not <laughs> chefs, they're very honest. They, 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 no, they are very honest. They, 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 so once you've rolled it up like that, so, you want to so get the bacon. Get the bacon out of the fridge, please. Okay, so this, is this pancetta or what is it? No, this, this is Alsace uh, and Alsace bacon. So wow. So what we do now. It looks like pancetta though, doesn't it? Yeah, Beautiful. I think, so it's so now let's take that around. So this is basically here to, to hold it together. Hold it together, like a little parcel, so, Christmas parcel. That's it. And um, the whole idea is now, right, we'll take the clean film. If you could just hold that and give me a bit of pressure, James. Yeah. So now what I do is tuck that round, then release it backwards. So now we're going to cut through that. So what I do now is I pull it tight. That puts the pressure on it. But you don't want too much. You don't want air in this. this no. So now, now we take the cocktail stick, put four holes in it around it. Sense. So what we do now is roll it on here. Yeah. To get it really nice and tight. It's Up very easy to do at home, huh? Very yeah, easy. <laughs> <laughs> but you're doing, you're, but no, your your restaurant sits. Your restaurant sits how many? Uh, Forty-eight. Forty-eight. And have you changed that over the years? Or? Uh, it used to sit fifty-six, but we've taken a table out so we can get more space in for the waiters. Right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just. Uh, and it's, you leave it like that. That's the one so that we've now, got. So now, lovely steamer. technique, really, so, Daniel. Really, you made so that look very easy. Thank you. you made it so, so now easy. that goes into the steamer. I can't yeah. even. Talk and that needs to, to cook for twelve minutes. So we've got one in there that needs a minute and a half <laughs> left. So. Give it another minute, chef. Another like minute. Okay. Top. That's fine. So okay. So right, what we need to do now is if you start warming that through, chef. Okay. So what in what is what is this that I'm warming up over here? What have, we got the lentils first. So we've got a lentil puree. So basically, what I've done is I've cooked lentil. Uh, I've um, soaked them overnight in um, in uh, cold water in the fridge. Yeah. Passed it off, and then I've cooked them in a chicken stock with uh, aromats, which is carrot, celery, uh, garlic, and bay leaf and thyme. So now this is a spiralizer. Okay. 
I've taken a little bit out. It's not seasoned <laughs> yet. <laughs> Don't anymore. It's perfect as it is. Yep. Perfect. What, what I do now is take a cloth, clean one, put the potatoes in there. We need to take the moisture out of the potato. Now we take the quail leg. So this is basically a quail leg that's been uh, deboned, apart from the top. That's the tape. That's time. You want another minute? Yeah, then? another minute. So uh, taken the leg bone out, and then I've 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 stuffed that with a chicken mousse. And what uh, is got... what is this? This is the leg. No, that's the that's the arm bone. So right. basically, what I've done is I've taken the bone out of this part and left this bone in and just pushed it up. You're doing that with a pair of glasses, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Right, so now we're going to wrap this quickly. Right, this is the, just, the, just the technique of this, yeah. So now what I do is I work down, and what you're trying to do is... That's the difference between family food and haute cuisine. Isn't it fantastic Daniel, to see, though? Of course it is. Wonder, to see everything. Wonderful techniques, absolutely. So once you've got that, I'm going to, going to give Raymond a little taste of this. What have you got in this little... little so that's uh, sauce albufura. So that's basically like a... Oh no, that's the that's the uh, truffle and mushroom puree. Right, but there's a little bit of acidity in there. What's yeah? What's so that's white balsamic, but it's a white truffle balsamic from uh, from Italy. But what we've done there is we've let the mushrooms, we've crushed no, the mushrooms, yeah. Yeah. and we've let them oxidize. So you crush the mushrooms. Crush the mushrooms and leave them to oxidize for 24 hours. Normally, when you cut a mushroom, they go they go black, and I wanted it to be like a truffle puree. So what right. I did is I. I, I crush them and then leave them to go um, to go black. So now I've wrapped that. That goes into the fryer. I'm assuming it's the ones on the right, but these these one you want to use? Uh, yes, please. That's the ones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those are a bit left out. <laughs> yeah, we don't need that. So I, I hate to feel useless here. And I'm just oh, don't worry, chef. It's a... I'm you, st you stay there. I don't like to participate. <laughs> yeah, you can swap if you want. Right, James. What we need now? So we've got this. I'll get rid of the steamer out of the way. So that's that bit. And then you're going to finish off the sauce that we've got in here. So what is what is this in here? So that's a sauce albufura. So basically what this is, is a chicken stock uh, reduction with sh shallots, white wine and noli pra. So you bring that down. And what I do is I... Um... It's a velouté, yeah? Yes, it's a yeah. velouté. So it's like a, uh, uh, a cream velouté. From this great French chef. Yes, obviously. Uh, this copier, yes, the one. The most modern chef in his own age. Yes. Yeah. His own age was yeah, exciting. Right, so what are you doing with that then? That's the... So now I'm just putting the base of this on. Yeah. So this is where I get a lovely circle like that. Now I take my cutter. I'm starting to shake. So you, this is the, uh, how, many courses, how many courses have you got to do with uh, it? 16 at Midsummer for the 16. tasting menu. Yeah. And was, it, was that ever... That, it can't have been the, the... What was the goal for you, really, when you moved to Cambridge? Uh, what was it? To get the restaurant open and make a little bit of money. To be busy, though. That's yeah, the yeah. Thing to any and then, goal, uh, it took like four of us. Yeah. I think you have a restaurant or two as well. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I find it... Uh, the enjoyment of having a busy restaurant more than any awards or anything. To, yeah. to walk around the room and see people's reaction is... Absolutely yeah. beautiful, absolutely. Yep, that's <laughs> And to, to give a stranger you know, the very best moment of their life, you know, whether with food, with the environment, the welcome, the generosity, yeah. so rewarding, yeah. it fills you up, yeah. So what have you got in there now? What's, so what's this that? is a truffle mayonnaise. Oh my God, the truffle mayonnaise, so yeah. <laughs> I'm too small, so I'm good to get up. <laughs> so on top of that... Right, I've got a little bit of lemon over here. That's that one. So you've got truffle going on here, a little bit yeah. of lemon juice in just, the sauce. Just garnish the top of that. Is it an English truffle? No, this is a, uh, a Wiltshire truffle, Chef, but it comes from Australia. No, I think these are French, actually. Got a little bit of OK. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful, anyway. Where would they come from? So I've got a little it's bit... It's still the season in France. Yeah. Still, uh, absolutely, up to... So now I'm just going to take the end of that. So explain to everybody where your restaurant is then. In... So it's, it's right on the River Cam, which is a... Uh... Yeah, amazing. Happy with that? Seasonal? Yeah, right? it's amazing, Chef, yeah. Ah, <sighs> yeah. Well done, James. <laughs> I can retire. No, no, it's, it's, on the, it's on the River Cam <laughs> in... Uh, Thank you. ..in uh, Cambridge, just right in the centre, really. And, um... Just put this over here. So you're right, so you're right by... Is it by a park or...? What it... It's on the Midsummer Common. Right. Could so, have a bigger leg, please? <laughs> <laughs> right. Terrible man. You know, always like me. <laughs> so what I do now is I take the end okay. off. Now 
whip off the cling film. It's so lovely little techniques to learn. It's lovely, isn't it? I love absolutely. Uh, people ask me why why I still love doing this. You know, Saturday mornings for eighteen years is because you get to work and cook alongside and the greatest chefs in the world, and it's just it's fascinating to see like this. And to see them shake when they're <laughs> cooking for somebody, <laughs> somebody <laughs> next to them like this, it's brilliant. Who's well, the easiest, guys? You know uh, Come on. Right, so you got the lentils? The lentils are on the plate, yeah. Well, that's done. So now we just need... Sauce Looks around. spectacular. Look at that. Beautifully beautiful. cooked. It is beautiful, yeah. And you just leave it, leave it to rest a little bit. That's just all you rest want. a little bit. There we go. So give us the name of this dish. So basically it's papillot quail, duck liver, truffle, savoy cabbage, Sauce albafura. You mean papillot of Norfolk? Yes. Quail, yes. Eh? Just, just look yep. at that dish. How Happy spectacular coming. is that? Daniel Clifford, everybody. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank Looks spectacular. I'm Absolutely. sure it's going to taste Norfolk as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But have a taste of this then, Chef. At first, I'm going to look at it, and what I see is divine. Thank you. You can see the technique, you can see the cooking is absolutely perfect. The craft is there. Does it taste good? That's I hope true. so. But one thing I observe immediately, James gave me a glass of rosé, <laughs> and that doesn't go at all. No, well, me. I know it doesn't. So can you give me a little bit of Pinot Noir, please? Light, Chef, just, okay, just, from just, Burgundy, <laughs> please. Just eat that. Eat, eat that, I'll be He's with you. He's such a good old freak. <laughs> okay, it'll, let's do it. will be coming in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so yeah. I don't want to destroy it, which I will, of course. This beautiful flavor, very moist. You know, flavor is lengthy. The seasoning, bravo! The seasoning, James, <laughs> is absolutely perfect. I get the commie chef job, do I? That's mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> voilà. Thank you for not leaving the bone inside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice, though. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, there you go. Uh, right, we've got time for one more final dish this morning, so join us again in a couple of minutes when I'll be cooking a dish of roast halibut on the bone for all my guests, including Matt and Nicola Baker. I'll see you in a bit. Who's nervous then? <laughs> Welcome back to the final part of the show, sadly. Oh. But I'm back in the kitchen with all my guests, Raymond, Daniel, the brilliant guests, Matt and Nicola. Yay! But um, now, we're going to... I thought with these... The double mission is our chefs. If it's not pressure enough cooking for him, I've got him as well. So we've got four of them here, four oh, Michelin yeah. stars. So I thought with this one, I thought I'd really push the button. We've got some beautiful uh, turbot over here. Uh, and halibut, so we got. So you, you can use either or, but halibut over here, I've got some over here, so it's absolutely glorious. All I've done with this is portion it up into steaks, uh, but this is line caught. Uh, so what we're gonna do is cut this into steaks like that, so when you buy it, I think it keeps the moisture on this. I don't know about mm -hmm. you, Chefie, but a little Bottom. bit of salt over the top, and then I'm gonna get you to deep fry the sage with it, if that's all right, yep, and no then problem. we're gonna start roasting this off and keep this on the bone. So a bit of salt and pepper, get a pan on the stove over here, Bit of black pepper, and then you're going to deep fry some steak with it because we're going to do this little burn and wasette sort of sauce with it to go with some mashed potato oh, wow. with it as well. I so I thought about doing something from the farm, but then I thought, no, I'll do something from the sea instead. Well, Fine. it's interesting because my grandpa loved halibut so much. Sadly, he's no longer with us, but he used to have halibut every Christmas day. That's what he would have. It's a special treat. Yeah, as a special treat. Yeah. It is a glorious fish, then, it, Chef. Oh, completely, and uh, it's so rare now, so difficult mm. and so expensive. But it's still one of these uh, of these fish, which is you can still get. Uh, very it's getting more and more less and less sustainable. Mm. But we still can get it hot caught. We still can get it. The line caught stuff is spectacular. Yeah. 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 What I'm going to do is I'm just going to colour it nicely and cook it in the butter, and then we're just going to finish that in the oven with some lemon and everything else, and just roast this all off. So get a nice bit of colour on it. You're going to deep fry some yeah. sage as well with it. And I'm going to serve this with a little bernoisette, but the bernoisette's got a little bit of croutons, so this finest French bread, which I'm not going to... Oh, God. <laughs> that's the <laughs> way of it. That's, that's, that's the shame of dead. The shame of dead we did. And then we got the... Your, 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 it's like It's like fishing. 
It's like pandemic. 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 Yeah, pandemic. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but basically, pandemic. basically, I'm going to make some croutons with it as well. Chef, don't it's worry. It's bleached, it's full of sugar, yeah. it's full of uh, uh, additives, it's full of... Uh, it's um, what we've all grown up with. It's what we've all grown up with. It's a great thing. This is the finest bacon sandwich in this ever. It, yeah. keeps, it keeps at least for three weeks without... Yeah. No, that's great. It's the finest bacon sandwich the world yeah. has ever seen. Beef brown sauce, lovely. Yeah, brown sauce. <laughs> <Same> <laughs> news. I haven't told you, I'm in the middle of all this. <laughs> I knew this would kick him off as well. Oh. <laughs> that's looking good, though. That is looking good in the pan. Yeah, we've got a lovely bit of fish. I'm going to take the whole lot and just whack it straight in the oven now. That's going to go in there and for almost forget about that. I wish we'd forget about this bread as well while we're doing it as well. <laughs> but anyway, you're here to talk about loads of things that you're doing as Matt and Nicola. Your, your farm, I mean... As you know, you're a big supporter. The, the British producers who I have in this country, you're, you're a supporter more than any, I think, as a chef. Yeah. I'm 100%. Yeah. Yeah. But we're just saying there's no real programmes, is there, really, that, that are farming and food together and, and cooking. No, which... and I think it's so important that folk understand about that seasonality. And, you know, and you go into big supermarkets these days and sure. everything's available all the time. Oh, yeah, it's oh, kind yeah. of, you know, when you think of it like that, you, obviously people want to eat in an environmentally friendly way. But to me, the most environmentally friendly way to eat is to eat local and to eat what's in yeah, season. Yeah, but the problem, we still import 70% of our food in the UK mm. and only grow 30%. But mm -hmm. well, it should be the reverse. But yeah, we lost that, because that's the, that's the whole thing, the ethos yeah. of France, isn't it, really, as well? So you, 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 you steal my job. I'm going to... I'm doing that. <laughs> you wanted to do this job, so I'm going to give you... Go on, go on. This is it, Raymond. This is the lemon bit. <laughs> go on, then, Chef. This is, this, is the, this is your moment. Go for it. <laughs> well, well, Segment well, the lemon. Well, Off you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I, do you know what, though? It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, obviously, the French are renowned for having that connection with their food. Are, are we losing our connection? And well, we've lost it for a long time. <laughs> no, what we've lost is the seasons. Yeah, mm. but because that's in part France, of the when you go to the supermarkets, you only get what's in season. Yeah. That's the difference. But that's the fascinating thing when yeah. you go around Spain as well as France. When you go around, it's very zonal. When you go around areas that we've done a thing on shrimp earlier, and the, the, the Denny shrimp, which I spoke, talked about as well, you can only get it in that area. Mm. You, when you go further south in Spain, you get the shrimp from that area. When you go further north, you get it from that area. You don't get a selection of everything unless you go to cities like Barcelona yeah. or, or, or that kind of stuff, where you get yeah. all those markets which you've got of every, everything, really. Yeah. But even with the Barcelona markets, it's not become a... I dare say a tourist attraction, whereas France, it's not a tourist attraction, it's a necessity. No, it's a necessity, and you can see the supermarkets are amazing, how strongly they work with their local producers. Mm. It's unbelievable. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Well, we've had it. Well, let's talk about books and bits and pieces now. We got yeah, 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 yeah. With food and we, we, we stood on a pedestal. I've got a pedestal for you, Chef. Will, yes. a, will a chopping board work? Yes, next one. Thank Perfect. <laughs> no, I did ask him. <laughs> <laughs> it was for a long time. No, it's a bad right. A bad right. <laughs> just don't used to be small. So just don't go good. wandering off. That's the thing. But tell, tell yeah. us about this thing, because this is this is another one of your loves as well. Writings. Yeah. This is your first book. Yes, it's Best my first seller book. that we talked about earlier. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. my first book. And it's... And like we're talking about the seasons and things, the book's going to be the seasons. And it's lovely to learn about the seasons and getting kids interested in the countryside and farming from such a young age is, is really important. And if I can just spark a little bit of passion, a little bit of love with children and animals in the countryside, then it's, it's brilliant. And get them asking questions like we've just been talking about, about food and seasonality. Then that's, that's great and, you know, mm. that's what you want. Well, I'm in between two, two Star Michelin chefs and I'm about to cook Bernard so Oh, Star Michelin. I'm about, I'm about to wander off. I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> two, two, two Star Michelin chefs here. Right. Yes, that's so, right. But yes, go on. Get the I'm never good, good at mathematics. And so I've got right. a swimming badge. That's about it, really. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we get this nice note. So the key to it is having all the ingredients prepared. We've got a deep fried sage, we've got a crouton. Uh, over there, I've got my uh, little bit of chopped egg. We've got our lemon. You'd like to chop up the little. I love this as well as juice in there as well. But the, Very much a little bit of lemon in there. When do you add the capers and bits and pieces? Why you add so much butter? Cut it by half. There's four people. You add water. You deglaze with water at the end, and you have the most extraordinary juice. Try it. Okay. God, for God's sake. <laughs> hold on, hold on a second. Hold so on. Nobody's noticed this. Movie stopping. Hold on. Two words. <laughs> oh. Turn it down. There you go. This was my dish, but it's about to change. Stand on here. Stand on here. It's okay. 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 It's Pear, chef, pear dish. You, oh, you kill people. Not, don't... Uh, <laughs> well, look at this. Look at this. Uh, two of you, huh? That's, uh, that's, that's plenty. <laughs> no, <laughs> 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 
Oh, you don't want to throw him in black, you know, just... So what's happening here, which is really important Go to know... It. People are looking at you, When chef. you cook yeah. your butter, when you cook your... I cook to you or to... To them? me, to me, okay. chef, to me. So, when you cook... Well, you know it all, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have to tell you. Yeah, but so does James, but butter, we're teaching him. In butter, you've got so solid... Uh, particles yeah. which are going to brown with the heat. That's what makes see start forming. The next stage is browning, and now that's ready. Water. Water, session. Okay, très bien. So ready? first, bit of lemon juice. Look at that. Woo! You got a gorgeous butter. I'm not just too... saying, I'm gonna have to watch this back to see what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and you create a nice emulsion. A little bit of water. Voilà. Do you want the capers in? A bit of pepper. Pepper? It's capers. Pepper. Let's go ahead for everything. Let's put it all. Parsley? Don't pepper chef, yeah. Parsley? Yeah, <laughs> parsley. <laughs> this is brilliant. Last parsley. This so is brilliant. Lemon? Lemon, all the lemon. Eggs? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, get them in. Who's and recipe keep is this? a little bit for the top. Yeah, got a little bit, yeah. A bit of parsley for the fish We well. chef, I'm on it. For the top. Oh, <laughs> brilliant. We should be helping as well. I know, can we, is there anything we can do? <laughs> yeah, you're going to be washing up in a minute. <laughs> I'm going to need a drink. <laughs> right. right. So let's you finish off those. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, chef, rub over there. Gonna... Looks as if I've done it. Right, off you go. <laughs> it's amazing what we've just done there, oh, ain't it, Daniel? It's just oh, fantastic thing. Well done, James. Well done. Right, That's get brilliant. yourself a plate. Moment. We'll put three plates on here. Move that out to one side. And you notice? What's that? 200 gram less butter in that recipe. Well, yeah. When you know that about, this is about 100 billions of ill health mm. through bad eating. You see what happened, James? Yes, I'm listening, With butter yeah. and uh, cream, etc. after having done my souffle with uh, cheese. <laughs> <It's just laughs> yeah. I was going to think about that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's all right. We can laugh about ourselves. That's a great quality. It right, took me 17 your... years to learn about, to laugh about myself. Right, that's your fish. Last minute, I'm going to throw the croutons in. Look at this. Bang on time together. Look at this. <gasps> It's amazing what we just created, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. I'm living the dream. I'm sure Raymond Blanc just popped in and uh, <laughs> took over. Don't know what you're talking about. We'll edit that bit. <laughs> I wish I'd been a, right at the beginning, because I would change that recipe don't completely. Worry, but... <laughs> we'll, we'll edit you out. It's as if you yeah, weren't yeah. even here, yeah. Raymond. Bit of French influence. <laughs> oh, look. It's incredible how a sauce can elevate something. Can you talk about it? your yeah. book, by the way, please? <laughs> <laughs> I read it a little bit and I loved what I saw, so I, yeah. I may ask you to become my ghostwriter. Oh, that, I'm, so I'm there, I'm there, Raymond. If you cook for me, I'll write for you. <laughs> well, it's easy. <laughs> we have a deal. No, definitely. <laughs> I think I've got the better deal. <laughs> right, so there we have it. Lovely. It's amazing what me and Daniel have just achieved, with no help whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> We've got our roasted fish. It looks beautiful. On the bone, oh, with a little bit of lemon. Uh, just a simple little sauce that anybody can do at home. But remember, if you're making this, use a little bit less butter awesome. next time. There you well, go. Uh, bon appetit. Well, well, well done, Tim. Well, 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 Bon appétit. There we have it. Wow. Merci, merci, there. Merci, merci. What a privilege. Merci, merci, merci. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, you're allowed to. We can share. Do you want to share? It's worth the effort, won't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's worth the effort. Look at that. Oh, that fish is absolutely divine. Fish is lovely, isn't it? It's just... Honestly, that is heaven. Well, certainly that's all we've got time for today. A massive thank you to Colin and Paulette for those amazing cakes earlier on in the show. Daniel, of course, Raymond, and Matt and Nicola Baker. Great. Good luck with everything. It's on tonight. Yay! Tonight, 8 o'clock, Channel 4. That's what it's on. We'll see you back <laughs> at the same time next Saturday morning. We're joined by Chef Simon Hulston, Galt Blackiston, Adam Richmond from Man vs Food will be here. And also I'll be joined by the world-famous singer Sabrin Turva will be here as well. I'm looking forward to that one. Until then, take care. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. We're off to the pub. Come on. <laughs> <laughs>